All right, thank you. And if anyone could uh, please take your seats, we'll get started on the next panel. So thanks everyone for joining us again for uh, the next se segment of our first net summit. Um, without uh, further ado, I'll hand it off to our moderator for our next panel, Michelle Farquhar from Hogan Levels. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks everybody for joining us here this morning. We greatly appreciated those enlightening remarks from FirstNet board member Sue Swenson. And we're going to follow up here on this panel by digging a little bit deeper. And each of the panelists here have played a key role in the development of FirstNet and what proceeded. As you may know, this has been a long-standing issue of public safety interoperability. And back when I worked at NTIA and the FCC in the early 90s, 1993 to 97, this issue was at that point first and foremost. We had an issue, a working group then called the Public Safety Wireless Advisory Committee that was working on this issue before anybody knew what broadband was. And we still haven't quite solved the problem. So I know this is something deep in my heart, very close issue to me. And I look forward to hearing more from our esteemed panelists. We're going to start with John Branscombe, who is Senior Counsel for Communications and Media Issues to the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. He served at the FCC as well as Deputy Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, Chief of the FCC's Spectrum and Competition Policy Division, and Legal Advisor to the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Second, we have Admiral Jamie Barnett, who is co-chair of Venable's tele telecommunications group and a partner at the firm's cybersecurity practice. He has had a distinguished career in the public and private sector with over 30 years of experience in the U.S. Navy and the Navy Reserve, rising to the rank of Rear Admiral. Admiral Barnett also served as chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau at the FCC, where he led many major rulemakings, including E911, public safety broadband, and emergency alerts. Third, we have Jeff Cohen, who serves as Chief Counsel for Law and Public Policy and Director of Government Relations at APCO International. Prior to joining APCO, he served as a detailee from the FCC for the Democratic staff of the House of Representatives on the Energy and Commerce Committee. He was an author of the public safety legislation enacted in February 2012, <coughs> along with John Branscombe. Fourth, we have Andy Siebold, who's been involved in the public safety and communications issue for more than 40 years, serving first as a first responder himself, and then he moved over to RCA Mobile Communications and Biocom, and he served for many other uh, entities beyond that. And he designed the first paramedic radio, sending voice and EKG from an incident to a hospital. He currently volunteers his time to the public safety community to help on this issue and he serves in that role for the National Sheriff's Association and the International Association for the Chiefs of Police. And finally, we have Dr. Ken Budka, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Alcatel-Lucent's Mission Critical Communications Business Division. He led an R&D effort that creates public safety wireless networks based on an open standard, as well as commercial broadband wireless technologies, which began in the wake of some of the public safety incidents. He recently served as vice chair of the 15-member Technology Advisory Board for the First Responder Interoperability uh, established by Congress to set minimal, minimum uh, technical interoperability requirements for the FirstNet Public Safety Network. Let's give a round of applause for these panelists. Now, this will be an interactive session. So we'll hold questions till the end, and we'll go through all the speeches. Everybody will make remarks for about five to eight minutes, and then we'll turn it over to some questions by me and then the audience. We're going to start with John. OK, well, I apologize. I don't have any slides here, so um, I think all my colleagues do. But um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to CCA for, uh, for hosting this summit, um, for, for inviting us. I mean, CCAs are, are great partners for us, uh, for those of us who work on the Hill, um, always willing to testify, you and your member companies, we really appreciate it, and we appreciate you um, putting forth your views in our hearings and various meetings on the Hill. Um, so I, I work for uh, Senator Jay Rockefeller, who's the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee. And about two and a half years ago, three years ago, um, he put forth a bill that would reallocate the D-Block to public safety 
and find uh, dedicated funding to build out this network um, as a nationwide interoperable uh, network for public safety. There were a lot of naysayers, as you can imagine. Um, people thinking that this would not be able, you know, there's no way this would get through Congress the way that Congress is. Um, but I think what made the difference is that, you know, public safety, you know, as Sue did such a great job in, uh, in her presentation, um, this was a public safety initiative, and it was truly unique in that um, public safety all came together, united and unified that this was a priority, that nationwide interoperability was something they should really fight for. And Senator Rockefeller took it, you know, very seriously and was willing to step up to the plate and, and move his bill forward, which it, we were very grateful it eventually became law. Um, you know, and, and in looking at what the bill was supposed to do, it was, we were trying to figure out how do we come up with solutions to, you know, the issue of cost and resources to build out such a network? How do we solve the, you know, the interoperability issue, governance issues, and so, this first net um, is the creation of all those efforts on the Hill. Um, I think I was really glad to hear Sue talk about the importance of state outreach. Certainly that's baked into the legislation. Uh, Senator Rockefeller is a t former two-term governor. Um, you know, st this state consultation process is critical and it's, you know, it's got to work for local and state first responders. So I'm glad that um, certainly they've um, been very busy, but I think they're going to sort of increase the level of consultation. Uh, Sue handed these regional and these uh, individual state meetings, and I think that will be really important because, you know, the legislation uh, gives the D-Block, which is about $2.75 billion in value according to the Congressional Budget Office, it dedicates these $7 billion in auction revenues, and that's revenues from um, auction of specified spectrum bands at the FCC. And also, part of the legislation is creating this incentive auction authority, which I know there, there's bound to be multiple sessions and days ahead on that outreach. I know CCA is very active at the commission. Um, and sort of harness the revenues from those auctions to build this out. But then there's also the $135 million state and local implementation grant program, the SLIGP, as Sue called it. I don't like that acronym, but, <laughs> you know. Um, but anyway, that money will actually help the states plan, identify. So w we meant for the states to have a, a very significant role. Um, and also, I just want to touch on that rural areas are very important. As Sue said, this is a concurrent um, network deployment plan. Uh, for Senator Rockefeller, being from West Virginia, he totally understands the needs. This has to work not only in the urban areas, but also the rural areas. And so I think that's why it's very important um, that you guys are having this conference today, and, and I think there are opportunities to partner and collaborate, and uh, we look forward to those. So I don't really want to go on any more than that. Um, I'll turn it over, and then we can go to questions. Thanks very much, Jan. <laughs> Admiral Barnett. John, I think I speak for the crowd in, in expressing our uh, deep disappointment that you didn't have any slides. I just <laughs> Now, that was great, and it's, uh, I'm Jamie Barnett, and uh, former Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau at the FCC, and it is delightful uh, to, to be on CCA's panel here uh, with Michelle and these other uh, August folks. John and, and uh, Jeff, as she mentioned, uh, were critical in putting together the legislation that is going to make this uh, network a reality. Uh, Andy and Ken uh, were key advisors on all the way through, both to uh, the Hill uh, to the agencies and have provided in input to the, both have provided input to the FCC which by the way as a former FCC I would say never underestimate the the power for petitioning your government when you file stuff with the FCC uh, it does get read as these former FCCers uh, will tell you it gets read and it's it gets uh, incorporated into the thinking so I would uh, encourage uh, you, you to continue to do that uh, and then Michelle, uh, she, didn't, she didn't tout herself, but she's a, a longtime uh, active person in this area and uh, advised uh, at some personal cost to her, I think, the, the uh, Public Safety Spectrum uh, Trust uh, for a long time, and she's been a player in this as well. So uh, there's a, a kind of an inside joke in the Navy about how hard nuke power school is for the people who go through it. I'm not a nuclear person, but uh, the, the, the final exam, they, they kid, uh, is one hour long. And uh, you open it, and there's one question, and it says, uh, in the time available, with the materials that you find in your desk, create life. Uh, 
Well, I think that's about how hard what FirstNet is up against, and, and I appreciate the fact that we have folks like Sue Swenson and the others, a tremendous board on there who are doing this, truly putting uh, the wheels on the car as it goes down the highway at, at, uh, at top speed. Um, so, uh, yes, here we go. Um, so, following up my tenure at uh, the FCC, I was uh, lucky to go to, for a little while before I went to a Venable Law Firm, uh, to the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, where they sponsored me to uh, create this report, what, which is called, What Should FirstNet Do First? And I'm not plugging it because you don't have to buy it. You can download it from the website if you, if you want to. It was published in September, right before the first meeting of the FirstNet Authority, uh, actually the next day. And so one of the things that I, and talking to Michelle, we're talking about timing, and so I wanted to mention a couple of things about that. Uh, and in some ways to grade myself, because at that point what I was doing is, is projecting based on what we had heard from NTIA and what the statute actually said about the timing. And so you've heard a little bit more of an update about, uh, about that today from Sue Swenson. And one of the things that I, I think we have to, to, to recognize is we need to give FirstNet some time. This is, this is a program that has tremendous potential. But it, it doesn't happen overnight. And I know as soon as the first net board got named, the expectations jumped through the ceiling. And Sue would probably tell us they haven't really come back down yet. Uh, it's going to happen, uh, but we need to give it time. So up here you can see that the planning process, they actually beat uh, my projections on that of when they brought out the, the grant guidance uh, for the states. I think that's going to happen, start happening. The, the uh, distribution will start this summer or mid-July. And it's going to take some time for the states to do that. The statute requires. Uh, that FirstNet take into account uh, what the states come up with, which is a logical di dialogue uh, with FirstNet's uh, logical customers. And I think it's important to recognize that, that the end user is public safety, uh, but the states have a significant role as kind of the customers and the people that will facilitate it and in, in some ways pay for it. This network is going to roll out over time. Uh, it will have phases. It will be both rural and um, and, and urban uh, at each phase, uh, and, uh, but, but it will take time, and so we have to allow them to have time. And, and we can talk about some of the rest of this, this chart, which is in, in the book, but I did want to grade myself on that. Uh, one of the things that I know that they're working on is a cost model. I think it's going to be important to public safety users, uh, to stakeholders in this network, uh, many of whom are in this room, and, uh, and to the, uh, the states themselves to understand exactly what the cost is going to work. So I think that's going to be an important thing to help people come along. We need to give them time on that as well, but I think it will, will help. The network will evolve in stages, uh, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit because um, even though it's going to take a while to get all the input, to get the, the network going, the early deployers uh, are, are very important for a couple of reasons. One is, I think they can teach us a whole lot about how this network should work. And the other thing is, uh, I don't think we want to wait until we spring the network out all at one time. So uh, stage development and early wins are incredibly important. And actually, Sue, and, and I apologize, I had to step out for a second, so I may have missed this part. Sue is doing some uh, critical work and working with the early deployers that we already have on the books in the next phase. And, and the, the most encouraging thing that I can uh, that I've heard is that FirstNet is very open to the best ideas. Uh, I, I think that's an incredibly good thing because there are a lot of good ideas and, and what may work in one part of the country may be, need to be slightly developed a different way in another part. Uh, they are incorporating the states into that process and I, I think that's uh, important as well. I do think it's important uh, that we, we plan a resilient network. I think the, the lesson from uh, Superstorm Stan Sandy is uh, that it, it, it is going to have to have some resilience. That also may be a phased uh, thing. And then because, uh, and we heard Sam uh, again talk to the, uh, the House Commerce Committee or subcommittee, uh, that this is going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be across the country. It's going to be hardened. And so for that reason, I think we do have to look at satellite solutions to augment the, the network, and they need to be sensible ones and, and integrated in such a way uh, that will really work. So with that, I, I think I'll finish and, and turn it over then to uh, my colleague, Jeff Cohen. But thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Jeff? Pause as I try to figure oh, this out. Escape. Escape. Well, 
Wells fails hit you escape. You can use my slides too. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> Did it come up? Uh, no. Okay. Do you know which one it is? It should be next. Do Andy's slides. I think he teed them up in order. Oh. So what, whichever is the next slide. Yes, very next slide. Got it. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> if this is any indication that this is a challenge, I don't know what to expect from FirstNet. Uh, Jeff Cohen from APCO International, um, and a pleasure to be here. Still. <laughs> I have used PowerPoint before, <laughs> it may not be evident. Uh, pleasure to be here, and uh, I, I think that uh, if there's any indication of, of what the legislation is leading to is an association like yours uh, hosting a FirstNet Summit in the first place and having uh, a representative of, of an association of public safety here to address you, and, and that's terrific, and I'm very pleased to have been asked uh, to come, and I'm glad to be here. I uh, figured I'd spend a little time explaining a little bit about APCO uh, and talking a little bit uh, about uh, what we can expect uh, for FirstNet. Uh, first, who is APCO? APCO International is the world's largest organization of public safety communications professionals. As the slide shows, our members, about 17,000 and growing, are state and local employees of law enforcement, fire, emergency medical service departments, and they man 911 centers and emergency operations centers. Put a different way, these are the people that answer the call when you, when you dial 911 and, and man the emergency operations centers when there are emergencies like unfortunately we were just reminded about. Uh, also, APCO members will be FirstNet users. We have a very direct interest uh, in FirstNet and the success. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, APCO, before I joined APCO and I was on the Hill and and working with John and many others, by the way, uh, in, in helping to get this legislation across, um, uh, we recognize the importance uh, of getting this done. So let me get to the next slide and, and show you uh, what APCO did at the time. It was a leader in the lobbying effort and it assembled a public safety alliance. Uh, it was referenced earlier how public safety joined together and they really did and this was with uh, seven other national level organizations representing all disciplines of public safety. It was a remarkable collaboration. It made a real difference and it showed you how important it was across the board, across the country, all disciplines of public safety uh, to get this uh, legislation enacted. And, and essentially, we achieved, speaking we, public safety community, basically what we wanted. We got the spectrum we asked for, and, and thanks in large part to Senator Rockefeller kicking that off, and then uh, who I worked for at the time, uh, Representative Waxman. Funding, it's a lot of funding. It's not all that we hope for, but $7 billion is a lot of money uh, for public safety historically. We asked for a strong governance model, and we got it. We wanted FirstNet, the way it's composed. It's, it exists. And every time that I meet and you think I have special access, I do not to FirstNet members, but every time I have the opportunity to meet someone like Sue today, I'm just in continually impressed when I meet these folks. Of course, I'm familiar with the, the public safety representatives, but especially those in the uh, commercial sector, I'm very impressed. I hope you, you had the same impression too after hearing from Sue. Uh, robust state and local consultation process and input. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about whether or not FirstNet's listening to the states and public safety. Well, it's in the legislation, as I think Sue mentioned, for a purpose. It was a major reason uh, and, and a major uh, uh, point of public safety to get in there, in there because while we wanted a strong national, nationwide governance body, we recognized at the same time you have to have a mechanism to hear from the state and local uh, entities and those that are going to use it. Important to leverage partnerships uh, and meet public safety requirements. There's tons of infrastructure out there. And while, again, people are mentioning, well, this is going to be a commercial network, uh, no, it's not. Uh, it can't be. It's in the legislation. Uh, and it's what public safety asks for. Yes, we should leverage as much of the infrastructure and the expertise that's represented in this room. 
uh, but it also has to meet public safety requirements. Uh, importantly, that you know, basing this on commercial standards is key to achieving economies of scale and to making sure that this not only leapfrogs public safety finally to the level of technology that consumers that I have in my pocket and that the bad guys have too, by the way, and finally getting public safety in there, but the commercial standards process uh, will help them stay there at the same time. And even before the legislation came about, a number of public safety organizations came out and endorsed LTE as a standard to use. Um, finally, and I put this last, I always put it last, but it's good to ground ourselves back and realize what was the original point of this and what is still our main goal, nationwide level of interoperability. Uh, that is something we don't have. There's been some, uh, some achievement at the local levels uh, and some very good achievement, actually, but, but certainly not what we need. Uh, partnership opportunities for, for the folks in this room. Uh, definitely, uh, from the public safety perspective, we, we uh, could benefit from leveraging the assets that you have and the expertise. Uh, another thing that's not often mentioned, but it's in the legislation also, uh, is to enable roaming agreements onto commercial networks. Uh, there's a lot of benefits from that. Uh, one is it can provide an, a not ideal yet solution, but a solution to give public safety access to the spectrum quickly before even the infrastructure is in place. It also encourages partnerships and device development, which is also really important for band class 14. Uh, obviously, uh, and we, a lot of mention was uh, made of rural areas, uh, public safety incidents can happen anywhere. Uh, obviously, we see it happens uh, in vulnerable areas to natural disasters and, and unfortunately to targets uh, of man-made uh, disasters, but uh, a disaster or a problem can occur anywhere and you need coverage everywhere. Uh, and uh, CCA members in particular can help fill those gaps uh, and make sure that uh, the network can, uh, can succeed there. Also, of course, there's the opportunity to lease uh, the spectrum and, and enter into covered leasing agreements with FirstNet uh, so that there's a little bit of a, a trade uh, as long as, and, and as Sue pointed out, uh, to be defined, but, but clearly public safety and everyone understands that in an emergency or even during normal, every day, whatever normal is for public safety, they always have access to the spectrum. That, that has to happen. Uh, and finally, uh, of course, there's this, this civic benefit that uh, by participating and partnering with public safety and FirstNet, uh, your own communities will benefit because uh, the first responders in that community will have access to the modern uh, technologies that uh, you're providing now to consumers, uh, but that to which uh, public safety currently lacks. Uh, and with that, I will turn it to my next esteemed panelist and look forward to questions. Thanks. Thanks sir. Andy? Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here in spite of American Airlines. Um, I wanted to really be here because while I was working with the Public Safety Alliance and we were walking the hill, we had an opportunity to convince eight representatives and senators to change their vote, to vote in favor of the bill. Why? Because of rural America. What I did was I took each district of those people and I mapped it with how many rural, what their rural population was, what their rural area was, and I proved on each one that with private-public partnerships we could build out rural America in their districts and make them heroes. And this is the organization that's going to help do that, that's for sure. So let me talk about a little bit. I'm going to back up a little to give you just a, a, a primer, all right? Public safety today is voice and very slow data, land mobile radio systems, or LMR. It provides push to talk that's mission critical in nature, and that's very important to understand. As FirstNet goes forward, during Sandy, the LTE and all the other networks had failures. Public safety networks are used to what we call graceful degradation. So if the main back end of the network fails, we have another backup. And the final backup 
is one-to-many communications without going through any network. And FirstNet, if they're going to do voice, has to have that kind of backup too. So it's a long way away, but it's coming. The spectrum was allocated to public safety land mobile radio spectrum over a very long time. And what happened was as the engineers got better and better at farming spectrum, higher and higher in the uh, bands, each contingent, uh, each group of people went to the FCC and the Congress saying, we need some of that spectrum. And so it was divvied up amongst business and industrial, amongst public safety, amongst TV and everything else. As a result, what's happened is that today public safety has little pieces of voice spectrum from 30 megahertz all the way up to 800 megahertz and some Wi-Fi type spectrum up at 4.9. The public safety 700 megahertz spectrum is now divided into two segments. The first one is for land mobile radio voice and right next to that is the public safety broadband. I wanted to give you a glimpse of this because when we talk about interoperability, this is the type of issue we have. When I worked for Motorola selling LA City and LA County, I loved it. We put two $5,000 radios in every fire truck. It was great for business, but it wasn't a great way to communicate. So this is one of the problems we're trying to solve. Um, the FCC added more voice spectrum. They've been very good, but, you know, they're getting um, bombarded by everybody. So we regrouped and asked Congress to allocate the D block. It was an interesting four or more years. These gentlemen will attest to that. Um, I don't know how many pages I filed with the FCC, but there's a lot of them. Um, and so now we have the network. You've heard a lot about it. Um, the law does not provide enough funding to build the network, so the partners are a must if we're going to get this thing built. Now, here's the 700, upper 700 megahertz band as it's laid out now, and you can see that public safety narrowband and broadband are right next to each other. It's great spectrum. It's going to save a lot of lives. It's going to add, uh, it's going to reduce time for dispatch and everything else. Uh, Think about what's going to happen when uh, an officer is responding to something. They'll have a video of what they're going to get into, and they'll know lots of what's going on. But what public safety is used to using, which is land mobile radio, high towers, big sites, lots of coverage, is very different than LTE. So public safety needs to be educated about all the differences in this, and we're trying hard. But the commercial operators need to be educated in the differences in the expectations. So it's a two-way street, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so the purpose of the network, we've heard this before. Um, I want to make one very point very clear. This network is not designed today to replace existing public safety networks. <laughs> The land mobile radio networks must stay in place. They must be funded. There's an organization of which APCO is a member called NIPSTIC. There's another one, National Public Safety Telecommunications Council, that's made up of 30-some organizations. And we just published a paper that says why this is designed for elected officials, why land mobile radio networks will be needed for at least the next 10 years. I want to make that very clear. This is, there's a lot of good work going on with LTE, but voice is going to remain critical to public safety on land mobile radio. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, let's talk about opportunities for all of you. As I mentioned, I did all these districts, and I did more than eight, but we won eight of them. Um, and it's really, it makes a lot of sense. FirstNet says they're going to build out rural as much as metro, and I like that idea. It's really great, and it's really needed. Uh, but it's going to take partners, and it's going to take partners that have assets in the ground. It's going to take partners who want to expand their own networks in areas where it's never been financially feasible to do it before. So taking some of FirstNet's assets, some of your assets, putting them together, we can build out rural America, and we can bring not only 
uh, broadband to public safety, you can bring it to your networks and you can bring it to your customers. And one of the things that I did when I was doing this congressional thing was not only mobile, but fixed broadband service for people in rural America who don't have any access to broadband at all. So we're going to have a lot of opportunity to partner. Um, I've worked on both the commercial side and the public safety side, and I'm work looking forward very much to working with CCA and other organizations to make public safety in rural America possible. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Ken? Thank you. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, public-private partnerships, and this is where you all play a role in, in helping with uh, helping FirstNet get get rolled out. Uh, the legislation is a three-legged stool. Uh, number one, we've heard a lot about Spectrum. So Spectrum is the the real estate upon which this network will be built. Funding is a critical component, uh, and governance. And, and within governance, there is the opportunity for FirstNet to create public-private partnerships to lease capacity and lease spectrum to third parties. This is the important block of the three-legged stool. It's the part, important part of making FirstNet happen, making FirstNet national. And a uh, simple reason, if you, if you look at the funding arithmetic, um, so far $2 billion has been allocated initially to FirstNet. Uh, another $5 billion has, has been earmarked for a FirstNet uh, coming from incentive auction proceeds, incentive auction uh, to, be, to be determined and, and upcoming. Um, and then there's this nice blue box in the middle, which is really the key to building the partnerships and driving the dynamics between FirstNet and CCA to strike win-win partnerships for rolling out FirstNet nationwide. Um, there's a big funding gap between the $7 billion that's been allocated so far and the roughly 12 to $16 billion that the FCC has estimated for building and operating a nationwide network uh, for a 10-year period. And that's where... That's where CCA members and, and other parties, utilities, anyone who has infrastructure, anyone who has uh, toys to bring to the table, this, this is where um, you, you can help. And, and it's also the thing that drives the dynamic between FirstNet and carriers to come up with a win-win uh, uh, scenario. Network sharing is, is essential for, for FirstNet. If we look at uh, network sharing, there, there's different levels at which sharing, sharing can happen. Uh, sharing of the physical infrastructure, sites itself, uh, towers, antennas, shelters, transmission, backup power, uh, site support. Um, if you look at the cost of rolling out a network, the lion's share, the huge amount is locked right there in tower infrastructure itself. Um, that's where states have a lot of assets and local municipalities and federal agencies also have a lot of assets. They have a lot of hardened assets as well that can be used to build a network like this. Uh, and carriers also have network assets that can be, can be put into the, into the equation. Um, then also, um, networks can be shared at the radio access network. Capacity can be shared uh, between uh, different, different parties. The core network can be shared. And, and then we're all familiar with, with network roaming, uh, sharing the, the, the coverage uh, of, of, a, um, of a partner uh, uh, as, as your customers roam, roam throughout, the, throughout the network. Um, Luckily, LTE supports some nice ways to share capacity in a very flexible way so that uh, partners can become part of this network. Um, so uh, right now, uh, FirstNet is designed to be a shared radio access network. Um, and from that shared radio network, you can peel off into different core networks, a core network that might be supported by FirstNet, as well as core networks that are supporting uh, service provider networks. The LTE standard supports a way of partitioning that spectrum in a very flexible way so that you can have service level agreements for that, that sharing. Um, also in a very secure way so that traffic, as soon as it hits the base station, is encrypted and sent back to uh, whatever core happens to serve that, that user. Um, also supports prioritization and quality of service. Now this, this way gives a way of sharing capacity between FirstNet users, federal users, also commercial users, gives a way for uh, uh, CCA members and others to get access to hardened sites uh, and also coverage out in the middle of, middle of nowhere, also coverage in cities, coverage in urban and suburban areas. Um, in terms of benefits for FirstNet participation, uh, number one, uh, LTE roaming, uh, getting access to carriers and, and coverage throughout, throughout the U.S., uh, also being able to share infrastructure across the nation in a, in a cost-effective way, uh, and also 
device and application ecosystem. And that's one of the primary reasons why this legislation links together this funding mechanism and links together uh, private companies as, as well as FirstNet is to create a broader ecosystem for devices and for applications so that this network can be cost effectively managed and, and moved as, as it goes, goes forward. So, thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ken. I'm going to follow up by asking a few very specific questions. In particular, there's been a lot of confusion about the roles of the various entities involved in FirstNet, including the government agencies, the states, the localities, as well as some of the private sector entities that have been involved. Let me start with Congress, which created this entity, and ask John in particular, do you see an ongoing role for Congress, and are there any particular issues or concerns that you may be monitoring or uh, your colleagues on the House side may be looking for in that regard. Right. So, uh, is, this, is this on? Can people hear me? So, I think you know, the, obviously, the the biggest challenge was getting the legislation passed. Well, part of, that's the first challenge was getting the legislation passed. But there is ongoing congressional oversight. Uh, the Senate Commerce Committee has uh, oversight jurisdiction over FirstNet, over NTIA, over the Federal Communications Commission. So, I think you know, certainly. Um, Oversight, uh, you know, accountability of, of how this is all rolling out is important. I know the legislation requires a number of re a yearly report, audits of FirstNet. But in addition, I'm, you know, you will you can expect that there'll be some um, oversight hearings. I think there was one already in the House. Certainly, Senator Rockefeller will be will be taking that very seriously. Um, related to that is how the FCC implements the the spectrum auctions, which are the funding mechanism. And um, we will be having oversight hearings of that process as well. Certainly, Senator Rockefeller has has made clear publicly that for him, the success of those auctions will be measured by raising sufficient money to pay for FirstNet's activities. So, great, thank you, John. Uh, Jamie, with respect to the FCC, they haven't really been as active in the process so far. Can you talk about what you anticipate the FCC's role might be here going forward? Well, you know, the, the, stat, the statute set up a, an initial role for the FCC in developing the minimum requirements for interoperability, which, uh, and, and th thank you guys for the short time frame uh, that that did. It was a very quick time frame. Uh, but folks like Ken and a lot of other uh, uh, folks provided tremendous input to provide those min minimum interoperability uh, things. After that, the FCC plays a, a consultation role. Uh, the FCC is, I think, uh, one of the expert agencies with regard to that. And, and so uh, I, I would like to think that there's going to be support from FCC for NTIA and FirstNet's uh, part of this. Uh, but the only other role that I really know about, and it's an interesting one, if there are any states that opt out, the FCC does have a, a piece on that, on, on an approval looking at can they actually operate uh, uh, in an interoperable standpoint. Uh, but quite frankly, opting out is very difficult under the statute, and it'll be interesting to see whether anybody could actually uh, do that. And if Sue is, is successful, which I suspect that she will be, will there even be a reason to, to opt out? If they're going to accept um, uh, innovative ways of, of solving this, forming the pu public-private partnerships that Ken mentioned, uh, then there may not be any need to opt out. Thank you, Jamie. Jeff, you've seen this from three unique vantage points, including now from the public safety perspective. Uh, one thing I know is that traditionally the states have not been that involved in the public safety side, which many people may not realize. Can you talk about what the public safety officials and your group in particular may have had to do to educate the states to get them up to the level they need to be at to take on this big challenge that they face with respect to FirstNet and the RFPs, et cetera, ro rolling out right now? Well, sure. Uh, well, in, in a lot of respects, the states have been involved because, uh, you know, and, and Andy could help uh, me a little bit on this, but obviously one major agency is state police, and a lot of states have implemented statewide networks uh, focused on, on the statewide public safety agencies, but also there have been some partnerships with local on today's current technology. Uh, what is APCO doing? What can we do uh, to educate? Uh, it's, it's been a uh, major initiative on my mind <laughs> ever since I came aboard just about a year ago. Uh, one way we do it is, is through our member communications. Uh, we have various channels. And then APCO has uh, numerous events uh, where uh, we use those opportunities 
also to continually educate people. Uh, another really good element of the legislation, which hasn't been mentioned yet, is that it required by statute a public safety advisory committee, which has been stood up. Uh, it's, it's a great broad spectrum of people uh, throughout public safety disciplines, and that's another way uh, to help educate uh, the people on the ground. So uh, between all those, uh, but it, there's still more to do. There's a lot of people out there in the public safety world that still don't really fully appreciate what this law is doing uh, and, and, and have some maybe some misconceptions. Let me ask Ken and Andy to follow up. With respect to the states, what do you think that carriers, as well as maybe vendors and equipment uh, providers, should do to educate the states and FirstNet during this period before things have really gotten launched, but are in the education and outreach process? You know, the, one of the biggest problems in all of this is going to be collecting the data. Sue and her team have a tremendous amount of work ahead of them because they have to collect data from the states, the locals, the tribal people, the territories, um, federal things that may be there. Uh, I know that in the county that I help maintain communications in, a lot of our sites are on forestry property, on forestry assets. Um, one of the things that um, is gonna have to happen is there's gonna have to be some kind of a standard for collecting data. You can't have every state come in with different forms of data. Now, uh, what I didn't mention is I happen to be co-chair of the APCO Broadband Committee, and we're working on a document now, which we hope to give to FirstNet, which says at least for the local level, here's a template for how you figure out what assets you have, do they need to be hardened additionally, and place some kind of value on them. Because at the end of the day, there's going to be a give and take between FirstNet and the state and the locals on the operational fees versus the in-kind kind of equipment. And that's going to happen with CCA members and, and network operators too. This whole thing is going to be a, you know, there's going to be money, but then there's going to be in-kind uh, things back and forth. Ken? So the essential part is to make the tent as wide as possible and open as possible. because. Um, assets that can be contributed to FirstNet not only include state and local assets, but assets that carriers have, assets that utilities have. And assets are not just limited to tower infrastructure. It's backhaul infrastructure. It's, it's dark fiber. It's, uh, if you look at, uh, for example, utilities have, uh, across their transmission lines, lots of optical fiber that's just lying there. That A lot of it is just used for uh, very low bandwidth applications that could be pulled into a network like this. Um, it's important to collect as much of this information and also I think it's important for states to become active parts of creating these partnerships and looking out for these partnerships uh, instead of just uh, feeding data, becoming actually a part of the process, identifying partners that would be good to work with uh, in their region so that we can, we can build, build, build the network. Jamie? <clears throat> so the, the states play an incredibly important role and one of the, the um, I can say other additional challenge that FirstNet has right now is that the, the governors have, have kind of gotten their nose out of joint uh, out, out of this, and they have uh, they initially uh, sent a letter to uh, I guess the Department of Commerce uh, saying that you know we're disappointed that there's not somebody on the FirstNet board. Uh, they've backed that up with another letter. There was another letter at one of the House uh, hearings. Uh, regarding this and so actually I think one of the things that CCA and its membership can help because you are very active in uh, many across many regions many states uh, to help a constructive and positive dialogue with the governor's office so it's important to be in, in, engaged with public safety uh, but the governors I think are, have, have to be involved in that well their technical advisors their homeland security advisors their CIOs and stuff like that and Sue in fact I think and there may be others as well are, are in engaged in outreach, which once again, as I mentioned, you got to give people time. It's only the board right now and a few employees. Uh, but CCA could, per, could perhaps help on that in, in providing a constructive conversation about uh, how the states can get involved. Thank you, Jamie. One of the traditional problems that public safety has had has been on the equipment side. Very expensive, one-off devices and a limited number of suppliers to provide those. I know this has been a concern on the Hill and with the FCC and other quarters. How has FirstNet uh, tackled this or are they likely to tackle this? Let me ask Ken and Andy in particular for your 
ideas on that? Um, first of all, let, you know, the reason that the FCC and public safety jointly picked LTE because it's an international standard and the volumes of devices are in the hundreds of millions throughout the world. So that's going to tend to drive prices down. The thing that people have to keep in mind is that some of the public safety agencies, yes, they all spend a lot of money. Handheld radio today is about $2,500. A mobile can be up to $5,000. Very expensive equipment, but it's designed. You can drive over it with a truck. Um, and the other th misperception that's out there, and I think FirstNet's going to going to work on uh, fixing this, is if you buy an iPhone for $199, the expectation is that public safety can buy an iPhone for $199. The problem is you're buying a subsidized iPhone. If you go into Apple today to buy an iPhone, it's an $800 device with no contract. So, and then you have to harden the device. So we're not going to be in the 200 300 per device price range but we should be in the 800 to 1200 dollar which is a long way from what they're paying now. Ken? I think one of the most important things and this is part of the, the work we did with the FCC um, there's an element of uh, deciding also what not to do in, in, in satisfying uh, public safety requirements or figuring out how you satisfy those requirements. Um, there are ways to satisfy public safety's requirements within the existing standards by designing things in a more robust way or hardening things in a more robust way. Um, it's important not to customize at a level where you can lose the economies of scale that you get from LTE. So as much as possible, the special features that are needed by, by public safety uh, for uh, prioritization or preemption or, or group management, that those things should be at upper levels, like a APIs that are kind of calling into the network, um, there shouldn't be a, a lot of uh, you know, secret sauce and customization within the network itself because that destroys economies of scale and basically we, we call it in the, in the business p 25 ifying LTE, which is something that uh, P25 is the standard used by Land Mobile Radio. I use the word standard very lightly. Uh, it's it's uh, hardly a standard, uh, not very well enforced. Um, but there's a danger in trying to meet little, little corner requirements for public safety that may not be so important and may end up destroying the economies of scale that, that you can get with LTE, but you can get some of the same things through, through software and, and applications and device features and functionality. Thank you, Ken. One question for all the panelists is there's been a lot of discussion about the partnership opportunities with carriers, especially rural carriers, which is very true, but there are also potential risks and challenges involved. Can you give some thoughts about those, especially how those challenges and risks might be avoided? There's certainly cost issues, hardening issues, and issues with respect to priority access that would need to be provided to public safety. Are there things that can be done now or ways to approach this issue that carriers can be thinking about now as they start their outreach and their thought process going forward on this, how they can participate? You didn't hear me say that. I told everyone I'll kick it off and I'll let everyone else speak. Uh, one thing that I've, I've said a few times uh, publicly and since the, uh, since the legislation got enacted is uh, there's a lot uh, that commercial service providers can provide that would always be the base of any network for public safety. Uh, and it's not mutually exclusive uh, to rely and, and integrate as much of the commercial infrastructure and know-how as possible uh, provided that FirstNet designs a network architecture and the, and the, the legislation tasks uh, FirstNet with doing that in, in a way, as APCO commented in, that, in its uh, notice of inquiry, in a way that enables flexibility uh, to enhance it. Uh, there's also nothing preventing down the road from further enhancements to networks uh, to make networks even more, as, as Ken was getting into, starting getting into a little bit of the one-offs, uh, down the road as well. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over. Yeah, I, I wanted to make a comment. I think that partnerships in rural communities are going to be easier than they are in metro areas. We don't know what the da data demand for public safety is going to be in the major metropolitan areas. Um, we don't know how many incidents there are going to be. We don't know when when, when we look at public safety, you've got to look at an incident in a metro area happening in a single cell sector 
or two cell sectors. And that's the important capacity constraints right there. When you move out into more rural areas and suburban areas, you have less density of public safety officials and more access to the network. And the chances of a secondary user losing network access are much reduced. That doesn't mean they're not going to happen if there's a tornado or something like that. But again, because of the nature of LTE, it'll be more localized than it will be anything else. Jamie? So if I could uh, give an example rather than a direct answer to your question. I see uh, Brett Kilborn from the Uni uh, Utilities Telecom Council here. Is anybody from Vermont here by any chance? Okay, well, so I can say whatever I want to about Vermont then. Um, <laughs> so uh, I got to speak at, at a UTC uh, event last month, and I met uh, a gentleman who was also a speaker there from uh, Green Mountain Power. And they told me a, a fascinating story I hadn't heard before, and I actually want to study it as a use case. Uh, but in essence, uh, Vermont Telephone, I forgot the exact name that they go by right now, uh, somehow or another ended up with 700, some 700 megahertz spectrum uh, from the early 2000s. And Green Mountain Power, Vermont Telephone, uh, worked with uh, the Public Utilities Commission, with the governor's office there, and they set up a network in Vermont. Now remember Vermont. I mean, this is a very sparsely... Um, a populated state that has a couple of mountain ranges in it and it's not great topography uh, for a 700 megahertz network and yet they, they did it and they hardened it. And the way that they hardened it was Vermont Telephone wasn't going to be able to, to, to step up to the plate and do that. Green Mountain Power was the one that paid for those sites to be um, uh, hardened. So here is an this is not public safety spectrum, but here's an example of how uh, that kind of partnership can actually uh, be used. And I think that that might provide an, one example of one way that you can do it in uh, rural areas. That's great, Ken. If I just piggyback on what Admiral Barnett was saying, um, uh, also if uh, if parties are contributing toys to the party, there's an expectation that they're getting something in return, and. Um, so uh, carriers, uh, if, you're, if you're involved in this, if you're bringing toys to the party, there's some expectations on, on access to the capacity, also service level agreements for the capacity. Um, that's extremely important in the util utility industry where um, utilities are also an important part of first response. Um, if you look at the critical traffic, the, the SCADA, the things that actually control the heavy iron out there in the field, it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth, but you will find parties that are willing to contribute their toys to the, to the party provided they can get access to some minimum amount, even under incidents, to make sure that they still can control the network, they still can shut off power for first response, they can still respond to an emergency. Um, that, that kind of uh, service level agreement, not being all or none, kind of uh, having that being part of the negotiation, we think is something that is essential for a network like this to, to, to work and to operate and to make, make, uh, uh, make it work. That's great. Andy, you wanted to? Yeah, I, I just want to want add one more thing because if the network is designed the way it was originally presented, and we don't know that, but if it is, there will be multiple networks, multiple frequency bands, multiple frequency <coughs> technologies in the device, including band 14. Now, what that does is mean that there will be devices available in rural areas that may not otherwise have been available because we will have this group of network capabilities in the device. That's great. Let me open up to, yes, up uh, there in the audience. Glad about that. You may have to talk very loudly. <laughs> uh, to, it's okay, to. Uh, well, we can't hear you. Can you keep the utilities here? As far as I know, the, the utility companies haven't been qualified to um, use the D-block spectrum yet. Uh, and I know that they've some, some localities have asked for a declaratory ruling. And uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on wh where that's going and when it's going to happen. Yeah, Jeff, do you want to respond? Go ahead. Well, it's... Uh, it's correct. It's, it's in the legislation and the way that, that any entity that wishes to partner with public safety uh, can access the spectrum is through what's defined in the statute as a covered leasing agreement. So basically, uh, whether you're a carrier, whether you're a utility, what have you, uh, you have to 
essentially be part of a public-private partnership involved with deploying the network, maintaining it, operating, et cetera. And if you do that with FirstNet, then you can gain access to the spectrum. That's essentially how the statute works. That's, yeah. No, I, that's, Jeff is absolutely correct. So the, the legislation does allow these public-private partnerships and utilities to share. I think your point is, is our utilities first responders is defined in the act and that they are not. They would, just like any other collaborator or partner, um, they could get access to uh, use of that spectrum, but it would be um, not as a primary user, but through a, a public-private partnership with FirstNet. Other questions? We're right at time. Oh, yes, one more, and then we're right at time. So, so in the consumer space, you know, we typically change out our devices every couple of years. Do you see that happening as part of public safety, or what, what happens to devices in this model? Oh, it's going to be interesting. You know, consumers, you know, every 18 months they've got to have a new device or something. Police, fire, EMS, they're used to carrying a two-way radio for five years or more, or until disintegrates, um, but in this case, what you're going to see is an evolution of devices. Public safety is most likely going to start with modems in the vehicles to power their notebooks, all right? And over time, they will move into handheld devices, and there's a question about whether a person in the field is going to carry one device or two, that is, their land mobile radio and an LTE device or whether over time uh, that will morph into a single device. But tablets are going to be great for incident commanders, things like that. Um, there will be more upgrades because they'll be less expensive. And as more functionality, as Ken said, at the API level and everything else, that will tend to keep them up. But my guess is that the first three to four years of the network we're going to go through about four or five generations of devices for public safety until we get it right. Yep. Ken? This was an important topic we covered um, in some of the work with the FCC and Interoperability Board. Um, basically, FirstNet is taking on the role of carrier. So all of the, the work that a carrier does in lifecycle planning, uh, managing releases, et cetera, FirstNet will be doing. And it's important that that be uh, done in a planned way, that an evolution be, be planned for bringing in devices, bringing in functionality, moving from release 9 to 10 to 11 to 12, and um, all of that becomes part of the planning process. And the expectation on the part of public safety is, is they know going to this network, there will be more frequent churn of devices. Hopefully, they will be a lot cheaper, so that won't be such, such an issue. Uh, also, we're hoping there will be additional functionality that will be beneficial to public safety to also encourage that, that type of uh, adoption of the latest and greatest devices. Thank you, and thanks to all of our panelists for the great presentations this morning.